It's an honor to introduce Jesse. Uh, he's a distinguished university professor and um, um, professor of engineering and professor in ECS. I don't know how many title, professor titles you can hold at the same time. Uh, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy burden. University of Michigan. Um, maybe most relevant to this, to, to our sub community is that he's also the director of the Robotics Institute. Uh, still kind of a new institution at Michigan, um, um, which is great to see, uh, focused efforts around robotics. And um, I guess what I wanted to say about Jesse is that um, the um, sort of a testament that the, the old cliche of academic freedom um, that sometimes is actually true, right? So we probably know Jesse mostly for his, uh, at least I do, for his work, work on uh, bipedal uh, robot locomotion. Uh, but it turns out, I didn't know about this, we learned the other day that he didn't bother to start worrying about robotics until he was a full professor. Uh, before that, he had had like two a other whole career careers. doing other stuff. Uh, with great contributions on uh, power management and emission control in cars, um, semiconductor industry, many things. And then he, one day he said, you know what? I do controls. Uh, looks like an interesting problem. Yeah. Looks like no one else is doing it the right way. Uh, <laughs> so today he's going to explain us how what is the right way to do it. Hey. Hey a go. way, a way, a new a way, way. <laughs> a new way, never the right way. Thank you very much, Alberto. Songbei, um, I, I had to turn you down last year. I'm really happy you uh, reached out again. I want to thank uh, Fang Zhao and Nima for tirelessly getting me from place to place. And Lisa, all the stuff you did to make sure that uh, the trip here was easy and well organized, I appreciate that very much too. So thanks for inviting me. Um, this is work mostly by uh, Dennis Daw, so he's at NVIDIA Robotics now. He spent some time in Pittsburgh and just recently moved out to the West Coast there. Um, first, I'll say a few words about the Robotics uh, Institute. So this is done in collaboration with Ford. At least for us, it's a new thing to have a private company with a presence uh, on campus. Um, we've graduated our first class of PhD students, so we just started year six of the robotics graduate program, so you can get a degree in robotics that has the same stature as a degree in aerospace or mechanical engineering, etc. We're not a department, we're an institute. Um, these are the core members, meaning the people who are doing double service duty to their home department and to us. These are people who are really heavily, heavily um, committed to doing robotics, and we're definitely looking forward to Nima joining us in September. Katie was one of our first uh, PhD uh, graduates. She'll join us after a postdoc at Georgia Tech. Um, so the building will open, or well, it'll be substantially complete, which is a legal term I don't quite understand. Substantially complete on Valentine's Day. So if you guys come in the summer, we should be moving in and getting all the labs uh, set up. One of the unique features that's being built right now is a, it will have a robot playground attached to it. And if it looks a little bit alien, it's because it was designed as a collaboration between our School of Architecture and a robotics PhD student using neural nets. So this is a dreaming and overlaying textures on um, outdoor environments, which came up with this. And the key thing is all the steps there, they're all different heights and different tread depths, so you cannot do anything open loop to walk up on, on, the, on that uh, water feature. So this is my team. Um, I've typically worked with a small number of students, four to five PhD students. Because Ryan Eustace is at TRI, I've had the great pleasure of part of his group uh, joining mine. And so we have, uh, we have Monty here. So Monty, stand up. So come on, stand up. It's OK. So he's a research scientist with Ryan and me. And he brought in uh, Lu Gan and Ray Jang from uh, Ryan's group. And so that's added now that we can go more from blind walking into perception and planning. Today I'll be talking about blind walking, feedback control, those little boring things, okay? 
But uh, we spent a great uh, part of yesterday afternoon in Song Bay's lab going through this. And I guess Monty's going to be visiting with Luca a little bit later. So if you want to see more about our planning and uh, perception work, maybe Luca could invite you as well when uh, Monty is presenting right after the, this uh, seminar. So I often have to defend why I'm working on bipeds and not something more practical like quad rotors or quadrupeds and stuff. And I just tell them I do it for fun, OK? When I used to work on automotive systems and or where I used to do proofs and abstract uh, differential geometric methods in control, no one came to visit me in my isolated office while I was working. Nobody cared, you know, you don't get these looks of joy when something happens. That only happens when you play with robots. You know, we're very privileged to be able to work in this space. But we also, we also feel um, more fulfilled when we can do something practical with this work. So my lab is fundamentally focused on the mathematics of control for walking. That's really what we're after. But we don't want things that work on only one robot. We want to solve whole families of robots at one time. And so one of the ways that we've taken our work on bipeds like Cassie and Marlow that we'll see more of later today is we've teamed up with Wondercraft, a startup in Paris. And you might notice a few other people you know, like Kaushal and Laurent Prali and Aaron Ames, et cetera, to work with Wondercraft to build an exoskeleton that allows people who are paralyzed from the waist down to walk without the use of crutches. So this is a two-year-old video somewhat early in the design scale. Oscar is the first time he's up and walking after his accident. The IRB requires the assistance. There's a safety cable. Nothing can happen to Oscar. He's feeling a little uncomfortable. He's starting to get into it. All of the stability is provided by the device, just like we would on Cassie or Marlowe. And so they got this going, and they've tested it on about 10 different patients. When you're there and you see the parents crying because they're seeing their loved one up and walking, I mean, it's, uh, I didn't think robotics would bring tears to my eyes, but it has. Um, and if you saw that gate was kind of awkward, everybody was leaning forward in it. And it's because the mass distribution on the exoskeleton was wrong. And so we helped them redesign the placement of the batteries, et cetera, and also improve the, um, the uh, control laws and the uh, trajectories for the gate. And so it's stable enough that you can have independent activity in, in the uh, device. And so these are now being sold to rehabilitation centers. And to be clear, I have no financial interest in this any at all, and neither do my students. We just do it because we want to get our work out. So this is essentially another way of doing open source software, getting it into the hands of companies that will put it on devices that help people. Um, today we'll be talking about Marlow. This is an Atreus series robot that Jonathan Hurst built. So this is a program where Song Bei and I were once upon a time supported by DARPA until they took away all of our money so they could run the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Right, Song Bei? <laughs> Pretty much true. So we had to all of us rush the uh, design cycles. And out of that rush design cycle came uh, Atreus. So it weighs about 60 kilograms. It has a two degree of freedom hip. So the yaw motion is missing in the hip. Um, we can also put shoes on it. So mostly we will um, it has blades, but it looks really nice in these Michigan uh, shoes. But there's no vision or LIDAR on Marlowe. It's completely uh, blind walking. Um, now, this is Cassie. If you were here earlier and seeing some of the 3D semantic work, we've put a torso on Cassie. It weighs 11 kilograms. Cassie is 30 kilograms, roughly. The torso is completely unprotected, so when we use the robot with the torso, we have to use the safety gantry. It's just too much time to repair it when it breaks. Otherwise, the robot's fairly robust, and if you're in here earlier, she was falling down all the time. Everything is uh, completely fine with that. Okay, so that's, that's my warm-up act. 
Uh, we'll get down into the meat of the seminar. We'll talk about models, um, how we've done control, and so you can see what's new that we're bringing on. And if there's time, we can always show more videos. There's, everybody has fun with videos. Um, then we'll wrap up. Okay, so bipedal walking. The, you have phases where there's one leg on the ground and phases when there's two legs on the ground. So one leg on the ground we call single support. If the foot's not sliding, then it's the standard robot equations. You can write them down in the pin form here. You can do floating base. That's your call. Now when the leg that's not in contact comes forward and impacts the ground, you've got a decision to make on how to model that. It, that impact lasts about 20 to 30 milliseconds. So do you want to model it as a comp stiff compliance or do what we do, which is what many in the community do. You take that short period and you shrink it to zero and you turn that force into an impulse. Now, if you have an impulse in a second order linear differential equation, just use your Laplace transforms, you'll see the, the position stays continuous, but there's a jump in the velocity. So that's what this is an algebraic representation of that in a nonlinear setting. So that's the impact map we use. And the reason we do that is because if we model this contact as a spring, it's very different in the carpet, it's very different out on the tile, it's very different on sand, it's very different. You introduce a whole slew of parameters which makes your model less accurate than if you just use this crude approximation. So that's what we do. So you put it together and you get a hybrid system, right? It's just a nice Lagrangian. You, the foot contacts the ground, you have the reset. Maybe you should have two loops because you have two legs here, left and right. It looks extremely innocent. How could this be hard? Okay. Well, the problem is you open up the, the equations, okay, and that's just for rabbit, okay? So it's 10 pages of 10-point font, and the exoskeleton I show you walking would be about 1,000 pages at 10-point font. Okay. So... The bipedal community, when I came into it, was just going like, ah, my hair's on fire. Okay, I can't handle this. And so everybody's using these simplified pendulum models. <laughs> so linear inverted pendulum model, you keep the center of gravity uh, constant. Uh, this is flywheel, spring-loaded inverted pendulum model, okay? From the very beginning, uh, in my group, we've been using the full order model, whether it's floating base or pin, doesn't really matter. So we started that on this French robot uh, rabbit. It's planar, removes the lateral dynamics. Mabel, also planar, but has huge springs. So we're really dealing with compliance. This is now 3D, 3D, and 3D. So we've, we've kept true to using the full model. And the reason I do it is because on these robots, it's the constraints that make it work. If you understand the torque and power limits at the joints and the workspace limitations, and you set that up in your trajectory design problem, then you get things that work. But I don't know how to take those joint limits and represent them over here, okay? I don't see how to do that. And so we work directly here. So that's just why we do it. There's others who really like to work with this, and I'm glad that not, we're not all doing the same thing. So, but that's just the approach we take. Um, our basic tool starts out with trajectory optimization to find a periodic walking motion. So we'll set up a cost function. The trajectory is parameterized, so alpha is a set of spline coefficients or something, and we'll do energy per distance traveled as a cost, roughly. Okay. Then there's some equality constraints on the walking speed. Maybe we're periodic, maybe we're not. But like, as I was saying, this is the meat of the problem. It's the, it's the inequality constraints that make the feasibility of mapping your mathematics onto the real system. Now, there's one other step we go to. So that's just for getting the periodic orbit. Can you get a controller from that? So I think this surprised people, that you can take one periodic orbit and from that extract a controller. So this is what the method of virtual constraints does. 
If you have a robot and it's walking, say, forward, there's a natural phase variable that you can use for timing the motion of the other limbs. So you don't have to use time. You can use a spatial variable. So we call that our spatial phase variable. And then what we'll do is we'll program the evolution of the torso angle, the knee angle, the hip angle, et cetera, as a function of this spatial variable. So these are called virtual constraints. You write down y equals this quantity, and you drive y to 0, and you've got a feedback control problem. So the feedback control problem is to take the trajectory that we have and then implement it on the robot by driving natural outputs represented by these formulas to 0. And so if you're successful in that, you've created a set of constraints that give you a lower dimensional problem. It's somewhat analogous to taking a floating base model, high dimensional, and then putting the contact constraint, OK? If you do that, you get another Lagrangian system, OK? And you could start the design right there. These are not um, physical contacts. The actuators are actually doing work on the system. So in general, the dynamics on this lower dimensional thing are no longer Lagrangian. OK, so it's not necessarily that there's a pendulum model corresponding to this, because those are Lagrangian. They're Hamiltonian mechanical systems. But that's the idea. You create this invariant surface. And the theorem says, if you can do it, OK, and you can find an orbit within there that's exponentially stable. And the transverse dynamics are sufficiently nice, the ones off the surface. Then the feedback will result in the full order model being having a locally exponentially stable periodic orbit. So those are the basic ingredients. OK, that got us a long ways. These are some of the students who helped develop that. So there's Rabbit with an extra mass and withstanding disturbances. Mabel, that's 30 centimeter drop off there. There's Haywan Park, if you know him. Ali Reza Ramazani, who's now at Northeastern. Just being mean to Mabel, she's blind. They're putting blocks in arbitrary places. I mean, they're just being totally mean to the robot, OK? So now we get it on a 3D robot, Atreus. And in the lab, even with camera crew present, it's walking, OK? That's amazing. Anybody done a demo with a camera crew and everything just like fell apart? Yeah, so um, those ideas got Atreus, which our copy we called Marlow, to walk. But here's the robot outdoors. It's Michigan. Those are harmonic drives. The stiction got higher, et cetera. The outdoor sidewalk is not perfectly flat. It failed miserably outside of the laboratory, OK? So got us a long ways, but it failed miserably. So Brent, who was uh, working at the time as a PhD student, I had read a few papers by Russ's group, and especially the work by Hong Kai Dai, we found inspiring. And so Brent took the idea, and he did the following. He said, I'm going to design a controller that is a numerical version of Eduardo Sontag's input to state stability, if you've seen that work. It's a way of doing robustness, OK? I'll explain it to you this way. Before, we're only optimizing the periodic motion and not taking into account how the robot responds after a disturbance. And Brent said, I need to take that into account in my controller design. OK, so we set up an optimization problem that had all the basic ingredients for the nominal motion. And then he adds in a set of disturbances. He can have a number of them. He can look at a number of steps. And then the weights would be, well, right after the disturbance, you don't want the robot to act like it's near the periodic orbit. You want it to have the transient to adjust and start correcting. But as you go more and more steps in, you want to penalize that more so that you come back to the periodic motion. Okay, It's a very simple idea. Um, 
graphically, you know, so this is your nice, beautiful, energy efficient orbit, you know, that everybody wants, okay. And then you challenge it with disturbances and then you're pushing off and they're not coming back, okay. So this is the robot falling down. And then what Brent does is the original orbit gets warped in such a way that it's taking into account the disturbances and it is attenuating them. So that's what his cost function was doing. And there's Dennis as a young student, as an apprentice. And they just threw him out so he didn't think that Marlowe knew ahead of time where those boards were or anything. Okay, just randomly out of the warm lab where the cold Michigan air was making the uh, harmonic drives, the stick should get higher and higher. I mean, who knows what the impact map there is, right? On grass, all, it was always a, exactly the same controller. So this was, this was imp an important uh, innovation in how we were designing controllers, okay? So he was using disturbances to create new initial conditions that the controller had to respond to. So he was designing in closed loop. We'll come back to that. But the other thing he had was he's adding an angular momentum. This sigma here is the angular momentum about the stance toe. And he'd have components in the lateral and sagittal plane, so into the body motion sideways, okay? So he said, oh, velocity needs to show up in there somehow. He did it in a way to preserve the second order nature of the uh, dynamics. Okay, so that looked pretty good. We could just say, hey, problem solved, we're heroes, okay? But my problem has been that at Michigan, there's this sculpture so by Maya Lin, who did the Vietnam Veterans Memorial as well. And every time I saw this, I would see kids just running across it like it's nothing, okay? So I said, can my robots at least walk across this, okay? So for me, it's just been calling to me, okay? So we took Marlowe out there, and, and what happened was the Discovery Channel was filming in the lab, and we did all of our usual tricks, and then we ran out of stuff to do, and everything was going well, that we were ahead of schedule, and they said, do you have anything else up your, up your sleeves? And I said, well, I've always wanted to go to the wave field. You guys up for that? <laughs> Stupid idea, I know. But, so, we did. There's Brent, there's me, there's our human gantry. You can see the guy with the tattoos. He's not one of my graduate students. He's way too cool, okay, to be a roboticist. Whoa. On camera. Uh-oh. Yeah, serious flames. Um, it was not good. We had to hide this film for a while so that the safety people on campus wouldn't shut us down, <laughs> okay? Um, so we failed again, okay? And this is the uh, Giovanotti quote. So he's an Italian hip hop singer. So if you're into uh, hip hop, you wanna get the Italian version. And what this quote is saying that, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than not taking the bet because you're afraid of, of failing, okay? So we always take those bets in my lab. I don't want to have any regrets that maybe we could do that wave field and just weren't courageous enough to try. So Dennis saw these failures, and so he's getting his act together for the PhD. You know, he's first, through his first two years of courses where he has no time, he's learned the lab culture, he sees what's working, he sees what's not working, and he decides what he's going to be doing for his PhD in the area of walking. And in the end, he said he wants to do various speeds, okay? He wants to do outdoor terrain and deal with external forces, and he wants a single controller to work in these types of things. I don't think he wrote it down that clearly, you know, when he first got started. I'm sure you've had to kind of coax out of students what they're really after, but that, that's what he wanted to do. So that's really what I want to talk about now is the core of Dennis's uh, dissertation. Everybody doing well? I'm not speaking so fast you can't follow me. It's okay. Oh, good. So, um, the first game changer was the following. So when Brent was doing his optimizations inspired by Hong Kai Dai, um, 
even on that Atreus robot, those, those codes were running uh, like 11, 12 hours to do a controller. You know, it's not forever, but it just seems like it. Um, so it was taking us multiple minutes per trajectory, and then we needed many of them to find the response to these disturbances. Okay, and so a young gut got it where each of these trajectories can be calculated in seconds now. Okay, so he was a PhD student of Aaron uh, Ames, then he came to Michigan for a postdoc, and now he's at Ohio State. So he's game changer number one. He's a really brilliant young man. Um, so we can do these optimizations fast, but we can't do them fast enough to do them in real time. So there's no model predictive control uh, hanging here. Our step time is you know, under a second, and so the optimizations were longer than that. You can't do it in real time, and the robot's 20 plus degrees of freedom, et cetera, so you can't do it. So you do the calculations offline and you store them, right? That's called explicit MPC. And the problem is the number is too big. If you only put five samples per dimension and n is 16, this is over 100 billion trajectories you have to store. Good. So what to do? What to do? So this is, this is where Dennis came in. So, you know, every lab has its biases, especially every lab director, and I was always like, no machine learning in this lab, okay? Everything we're going to be doing is going to have provable basis etc. Dennis had taken the machine learning classes. I was aware he'd taken the classes. I encouraged him to be, you know, up on the technology and stuff, but no, we're not doing that, okay. But that's what he did. And he wouldn't tell me he was doing it until he could show me the results, okay. So um, Dennis is super cool. So well, let me tell you what he did, though. It's awesome, okay. so. You know, we don't have silver bullets, but we have something that works really well now in the bipedal community is trajectory optimization. So we can, we can calculate hundreds if not thousands of trajectories in a really small amount of time. So we can calculate trajectories. Now trajectories are wonderful until you're pushed off one, because then what do you do? Do you want to keep following that trajectory and converge back to it? Do you want to find a different one to follow? What do you want to do? So this is where Dennis's brilliance came in. He says, what I'm going to do is build a surface. I'm going to foliate it with feasible trajectories. Trajectories that meet all of the torque limits, the ground contact forces, everything that these complicated models have. I build a surface. And then I'm going to find a state variable realization of it. I'm going to build a vector field whose solutions are the same as the trajectories. OK, sounds easy. Um, and then, if he has one of these surfaces and it's invariant and the transverse dynamics are nice, we can use our standby trick on the hybrid zero dynamics. So this is the key thing he's doing. And this is where the machine learning uh, was coming in. So he used machine learning to go from the trajectories to the vector fields, and I'll show you how he's doing that. It's simple. It's supervised machine learning. It's shallow learning. It's not deep, okay? Um, and there's theorems behind the method, and the key thing is the machine learning is to build a function that if it has this properties, there's a theorem that says the closed loop has these properties. So I felt good about it. Okay, so, but that, that's what Dennis did. Yes? Well, so you're anticipating or something that's really important, because if you have a vector field and it's locally Lipschitz continuous, you get unique solutions, right? So if any of these trajectories cross, that's a topological impediment to this working. And so that's something that we have to talk about, okay? It's all in a deterministic setting, so there's no stochasticity, but there's nothing in the setting to guarantee this. So. Um, so let's go back to walking a little bit, introduce a classical tool. Um, 
So how do you find a periodic solution in these hybrid models, and how do you check if it's stable? We're going to build that into the trajectory design process. So this is work of Poincaré, a very, very famous uh, mathematician, just translated into the hybrid domain. So this is a hypersurface, so it's, it's co-dimension one in the state space of the robot, so it's a set of points where the foot is on the ground. So a Poincaré map is very simple. You start out with an initial condition on that surface. You then apply the impact map to it, okay, that gives you the jump and the velocity. Then you follow the closed loop dynamics back around to the surface. And so the Poincaré map just takes xk to xk plus 1. So it's hard to calculate analytically, but you can calculate it uh, numerically. So that's the Poincaré map. And so to have a periodic orbit, wherever you start should be where you end. So that's simple. It gives you a condition for checking periodicity. And then if you want stability, you take its Jacobians and you look at the eigenvalues being inside the unit circle. So that's kind of standard um, uh, dynamical system stuff. Now, <clears throat> There's another way to think about stability, which is more Lyapunov-like, which is you give me a ball around my point in my Poincaré surface, and you give me a contraction rate. If for every point in the ball, I can satisfy that my next point is closer to the equilibrium, okay, than my original point by a contraction factor, then I get local exponential stability because this is like the contraction mapping theorem, okay, that you classically do in, in class. And so we're going to use this because calculating eigenvalues is very expensive, okay? So we're not going to do that. Okay, so I want to explain Dennis's setup. I'm going to first explain it assuming the model is low enough dimensional that we don't have to just build submanifolds. We can fill up the entire space, okay? I want you to see the basic idea. And we'll actually illustrate it on the most classic example, the inverted pendulum on a cart, okay? Every control person has to solve that problem multiple times in a career to keep their control creed going, okay? So, and to take away another technical uh, thing, I'm not going to work on a hybrid model. I'm going to work on an ODE. It's just, it's just bookkeeping to do the hybrid stuff, as you'll see. But I still need Poincaré maps. And you're going like, why would you still need Poincaré maps? Stay tuned. Okay, so we have our model. We find a periodic solution meeting all the relevant uh, uh, constraints that we talked about. It has a period. It has some initial condition. I pick a point in there and just call that an initial condition. And I'm going to do some bookkeeping here. I'm going to keep track of the solution indexed by the initial condition. So that's what this subscript means on phi. And there'll be a u eventually I'll have here, which is the corresponding input. Okay, so that's the starting data. I want to select a contraction rate, 0.9, just pick a number, okay? An open ball about my uh, initial conditions, and you know, if I can keep meeting them, I'll keep growing the ball. And I'm going to compute a whole bunch of other solutions that meet the following conditions. So, U indexed by the initial condition, the solution indexed by the initial condition, and for simplicity, they're all defined on the same interval. They don't have to be, but just keep the bookkeeping clean. So they start in the ball, they end in the ball, and in the language of computer science, I now have infinite executions, okay? <laughs> um, and then my contraction condition is the other thing I impose. Why do I do that? I'm trying to build a stable periodic orbit. I want trajectories that are contracting, and this is inspired by the Poincaré analysis we just did. Now, it could be that we can't find any solutions like this, so that's telling me something about the control rate that I have. It could be I can only find them for a small ball, and that's telling me something also about the power of my actuators and things like that, okay? So, but let's, let's assume that we've settled on a size of a ball and a contraction rate, and we can build this family of trajectories. How do I get a control solution out of that? Okay? So you can build that trajectories doing many things. Dennis was doing something like MPC, and that he would take his horizon to be three times the period, 
and he'd put a terminal condition that after three steps you were back at your fixed point. So this was the original condition for getting stability in model predictive control. Okay? But you don't, you don't have to do that, but that's what he was doing. Cost, solutions, constraints, invariance, all this stuff. So anyway, that's how you get it. So now if everything has gone beautifully well, so a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill, sometimes it's better to be lucky than highly skilled, but whatever. Um, here's our initial condition, we're flowing through, and then all those trajectories are of length, uh, capital TP, that's the interval they're, they're defined on. Okay. And the luck, I mean, we don't have this, because I want a vector field, and this means I don't have unique solutions, okay? <clears throat> so. Now, I want to build feedbacks, and if I put them to my system, I now I'm, I'm really building the closed loop vector field. And so that's what you see in the case of the working with the, with the complete model. So I'm going to give you a first feedback that looks like sample data control. <clears throat> okay? So my feedback is for a given state at time zero, I follow the control associated with that. And then after TP seconds, I update. So this is like digital control. Every TP time step, I just update. What's different than uh, what Jean-Jacques would like to call a maintien d'ordre zero um, is that we're allowing the control to change during that period. It's not constant, but it's still just digital control here, okay? It's being updated at the period. Um, you know, uh, warning, it's not a good feedback controller, but okay? So it's really a discrete time uh, feedback controller. So how, do, how is it working? Just to be clear, <clears throat> time zero, I have an initial condition, I apply this control, and I've already computed the trajectory so I know where it goes, right? So then, I follow it back, I've got a new initial condition, now I've got a new control signal that I apply. Okay, and then you keep doing this. So it's sample data control. Is the system stable? Well, digital control is a hybrid system. A continuous dynamics, I have a discrete time controller. My switching surface is T equals the period, and so I'm appending time to the dynamics. It's evolving as T dot equals one, and then when I reach TP, I reset time to zero. So I'm gonna apply my Poincare analysis to it. So I take a point, I apply my impact to it, it just resets the time, doesn't change X. Then I apply my uh, feedback control, I get a new XK plus one, okay? And they all satisfy this. So by my Poincare analysis, this system is actually uniformly exponentially stable. What's wrong with uniform exponential stability? We work really hard to get it, okay? Nothing's wrong with it, right? Okay, the problem is this thing does not respond well to a disturbance because you're following the trajectory, you get kicked off, you keep following this control. It's digital. In between the samples, you don't update. So that's why it's bad. So here's the inverted pendulum on a cart. We choose an arbitrary period because it's time invariant. It does super well. This is what any MPC controller would give. And the problem is you do a disturbance that's half a second before the next update and you get these off, off, awful oscillations. And if that's a robot, it's on the ground, okay? It's a pile of junk. So it's a terrible controller. Okay, so let's now see if we can build a different feedback, the one Dennis really built. So you're following the trajectory. At time T disturbance, you get pushed off the trajectory what control should you apply? The one that tries to drive you back here? Remember before, we just kept applying this control. Well, if you can find the trajectory that's passing through here and then index into the control that corresponding to that, that's really what you want to do, okay? It's obvious as soon as you see it. 
Okay, so that's the control you would like to be applying. And there's the interpolation condition you want to meet. Okay, so you have a bunch of data, you've computed all these trajectories, and if from those trajectories you can build the feedback that satisfies this implicit condition, then you're going to respond immediately to the disturbances. Okay, and so um, that's what Dennis does. It's an implicit equation, and this is where he uses supervised machine learning to pull this function out of the data. And so how do you do that? Well, you take an initial condition, you sample it at a whole bunch of times, and you put that in your table, and then you use the words features and labels so that you look like an intelligent human being, okay? <clears throat> what are you laughing about? It's true, okay? You take another initial condition, you sample the time, and you put that data in your table, and you take another one and you fill it up, okay? And then you run your supervised machine learning algorithms. We just use the stuff in MATLAB. You try to learn the policy, and then you look at the quality of fit on training data versus validation data, et cetera. And if you get something like this, then you've built a function, okay? And then the theorem says if you take the open loop system and you build that bundle of trajectories and you can find a feedback control that satisfies this interpolation condition that we just talked about on the data, if you can find that function, then the closed loop system will have the origin or equivalently your periodic trajectory as an exponentially stable fixed point. Okay, and it's the same. Um, argument from Poincaré to prove that this works, okay? That's the learning condition, and then this is the closed loop vector field that you've extracted from the data. Yes, right, and you said to go from this to hybrid, it's kind of a matter of bookkeeping, you said, right? But the, the switching is state dependent, right? Is that really so easy to book? It is, and because the way we do it is we move the switching point to the middle of the step, and then we switch on time once again instead of space. And the reason to do the switching here is because the swing leg is as far as possible from the ground. If there's a small jump or discontinuity in the controller, it doesn't cause problems. So that's how we turn it into a bookkeeping problem. You have essentially two sets of ODEs and some switching conditions, but the switching conditions are just part of an entire surface. <clears throat> okay, so you get uniform local exponential stability. Now here's the fun thing. Um, the Poincaré map for this closed loop system is the same as for the bad one. Okay, I, I don't prove it here, but think about that. What does that tell you? Exponential stability on a Poincaré map means almost nothing. It's not robust, okay? It is totally not a robust idea. Okay, this is much, okay. They have the same Poincaré map. What they don't have is the same uh, disturbance to state stability properties, okay. You need to think robustness. It's really hard. Okay, when you put this on the inverted pendulum on a cart, it's, it rocks, okay. And of course, I'm gonna show it to you on a robot, okay, because nobody believes simulations, because they always work, but that's so much, better, okay? Uh, okay, so remember I told you, you want to put this on a robot, they're high dimensional, and I showed you the basic method. It's really exploiting what you can do well, trajectory optimization, and then organizing your plan of attack to build vector fields, okay? Now we want to get this working on Marlow, the Atreus robot, and it has dimension 16 and single support, okay? <clears throat> So we need to talk about curse of dimensionality. What's going on here? So if I just do five samples in each state space dimension, the origin, two on this side, and two on that side, and I have 16 dimensions, that's 152 billion optimizations, okay? I don't care how fast you're doing them, you probably can't store them even on your computer, okay? So, um, I'm going to convince you that 625 is easily enough. Dennis does it with 25 trajectories, okay? 
is that a gain that's worth going after? So that's, that's what he did. Um, the big tool, once again, is going to be um, invariance. And I will try to show you what Dennis is doing that's different than what we were doing uh, before. But the big tool will be creating a hybrid invariant manifold, having nice transverse dynamics. But he is going to build a much more beautiful manifold than I knew how to build ever. So, OK, so let's focus on the invariant uh, surface. <clears throat> so this is what we always did before. Remember I emphasized a single periodic orbit, then we built this entire controller? It's kind of crazy, wasn't it? But I showed you it working on three different robots. Um, but what did it do? So here's the orbit. These virtual constraints define an immersion of that path, its position and velocity into the full state space. Okay? That's what taken this trajectory, which is a path and its velocity into the full state space. And that's what gives you the zero dynamics manifold. Oh, OK. Here's what Dennis does, is he says, look, let me go back to this. Whoops, running the wrong way. Wrong button. Bingo. So here, yes, this trajectory here meets all of my constraints. If they were inequality and they were strict, then I've got a small tube around here that works. But when I get a little bit farther away, who knows if the new trajectory is created by this immersion. Even though they satisfy the mechanical model, they may not satisfy the actuator limits and the ground reaction forces. Okay? So these other trajectories, that's called hope. Okay? This one. Okay. OK, um, so now what we're going to do is start with a single trajectory. And we're going to just take the immersion at the boundary, at the frontiers of the surface. So for this talk, we're leaving open how do you choose those frontiers. In the paper, IJIR, we give several solutions. And we've got better ones now, but we've got some nice solutions there. And so we're going to have this immersion, but only at the initiating part of the trajectory and the end of the trajectory. In between, we're going to use optimization as before. So we're going to take and foliate that surface with feasible trajectories. And so we're at the uh, equilibrium point, and we move out. And then eventually, we get to where we can no longer satisfy the ground reaction force constraints or the motor constraints. And so this is important information if we can continue our optimization out far enough to find where we fail, OK? So how is this related to what Brent was doing, inspired by Hong Kai? Well, the disturbances that Brent was doing was creating a family of initial conditions from which the controller had to respond. We're doing it in a slightly different way, is we're doing a more organized search of the initial conditions and not letting them just be where you are after a step when a disturbance has been applied. OK? So it's, a, it's, a, it's similar, but not, OK? So that's the way this fits together. But it's all about initial conditions. So the way you make this work, how are we doing on time? Two or three minutes, we're good, or five minutes? Five minutes? OK. So let's, we're going to decompose the model into weakly actuated parts and strongly actuated parts. So what's strongly actuated on a robot? Big hip motors, powerful torque at the knee, and stuff like that. What's weakly actuated on a biped, anyway? Well, the center of mass, unless you have a jet engine, so you've got direct connection to the world frame. You're very indirectly connected to the world frame through one leg on the ground. So that's a weakly actuated state. And if your ankle is not actuated, then it's literally an under-actuated component. But your ankle torque on a biped is limited by how much foot roll you can tolerate. Okay? 
So you'll have weakly actuated states and then these powerfully actuated states. And the fact is the weakly actuated states are low dimensional. So in Marlowe, it's like four. Cassie, it's six, okay? Whereas X2 is 12 on Marlowe and it's like 20 on Cassie, okay? So it's a huge dimension reduction here. So we design a periodic orbit. Um, this as before, we foliate the trajectory with um, solutions that satisfy the same conditions you guys saw before, the same tra attractivity. We build that out, and then we want to find a vector field. Now the problem here is a little bit more challenging because in 3D, these are not crossing, right? But let's project them to the plane, okay? So you can easily get trajectories that are distinct in a higher dimensional surface, and when you project them, you end up with this kind of stuff, and that's a topological um, impediment for finding a Lipschitz, locally Lipschitz continuous vector field that would try to give rise to the solutions here, okay? So you have to have that stuff in mind when you're doing your problem and setting it up, okay? So, um, just to say that we've thought about this a little bit. Okay, so it's harder now. You need to be a little bit smarter or a little bit luckier, whichever one works for you. There's a little bit more complexity in the notation, okay, because you're working with projected coordinates and stuff. Um, but you build up the same type of mach supervised machine learning, and then you get a um, theorem that says if you can build this bundle of trajectories and you can find a function that satisfies this projected version of the learning condition, then you have created a zero dynamics, much different than anyone I ever designed. This is a Dennis design, but you've got a low dimensional vector field on this manifold and it has your periodic orbit as a locally exponentially stable solution. And then if your transverse dynamics are nice, you can embed this in the full model and make it work. And so here's Atreus, here's Dennis, here's a student practicing the buddy system. He's supposed to be watching everything Dennis is doing and protecting him, right? Uh, that's Ross, Monty, okay? <laughs> So, you know, they've seen Dennis run hundreds of experiments. Boring, boring until it's not, okay? Whoa. Something interesting is happening here, okay? I think this is Dennis owning up on film that he's got a, a, some machine learning going on here. <laughs> And so we have a safety system that if the uh, yaw rate gets high enough, we shut down the power to protect the robot. Seem pretty smart, Songbei? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's what happened there. Dennis put torque on it, and it spun around, and, and bingo. OK, so um, Dennis was able to go on the wave field with his controlled ideas. We can only do the small humps, but remember, that's where we caught fire before. So we got all the way down. Discovery Channel is not there. It's just local people from the college, OK? So maybe that's what took the tension down on the robot. Maybe it has nothing to do with the better math. It's just that the media was not present. You know, I, I'm open to all sorts of uh, explanations for this. Um, now, Marlowe doesn't have a yaw control in the hip. So you can't just turn her, but we have omnidirectional walking. So if I want to go over here, I can do it like this, and then I can do it like this. So that's how we're, that's how we're controlling Marlowe. So it's, it's already showing very amazing uh, robustness, OK? And it looks flat in between there, but that's just because it's being cut with these little weed whackers. It's full of holes, OK? It's a mess. If I blindfolded you, you would be uh, in the hospital with a torn ACL uh, for sure, okay? And so we got there and back, and uh, yep. Yeah. So 
could we do something on the big humps, okay? And then we just snapped a leg in two. And the problem is the depth from the top of that hump to the bottom is longer than the length of the leg. So you, this is showing a limit of blind walking, okay? You can't go blind walking forever. And that's why we've gone with the torso. And you saw at the beginning some of the stuff that we've done with that. And I'll stop here. People can watch the video, and I can answer questions, OK? Hey, Harry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I learned something Wait. new. So. Appreciate it. Oh, um, this may not be a fair uh, question, but uh, just a uh, you know, uh, TP, that the period, uh, you know, uh, what happened if TP uh, fluctuate? And is there any uh, mechanism to uh, regulate the TP, or you know, variation of the TP is not uh, you know really bad uh, uh, from the theoretical viewpoint? Yes, we try to turn those into basically event-based decisions. So that's TP is the time. On the robot, um, it's more of an e event-based thing. So if the robot slows down, it's not terrible. But also what we'll do is we'll design that manifold you see. We'll design hundreds of them for different walking speeds. And what we actually do is during the gait, we are interpolating into the correct manifold, which does correspond to the walking speed, which is what's setting the period it takes for the next foot strike. So the foot strike is taking place within about 5% of what the nominal period was designed for. So all of that works out well. Michael, people, people won't let you talk without a mic. Uh, you show the experiments, you show <laughs> experiments at the end. Uh, is there a way to, to kind of know in advance the robustness to terrain and stuff like this, to, to quantify that? Um, so our ways currently are very indirect. I mean, this, this is really brilliant work, but it's certainly not the end of the answer, is that um, we have learned that it's better to be robust to slopes in the frontal plane than in the sagittal plane, just because it's harder to move this way than it is this way. This is a very symmetric move. So we have understood that, and so we build in a lot of robustness to lateral uh, disturbances and spend less time on the, on the others. And so that will vary for every robot. So what I'm saying, the answer is no. We don't know ahead of time. We can simulate it and have a guess. But from working with this robot and then working with Cassie, that would be different on Atlas. It'll be different on quadrupeds. Where is the weak point in the motion that the legs can put new forces onto the robot? And then you have to focus your robustness in where the mechanics has a difficulty getting rapid uh, footfalls to create new forces on the center of mass to keep you upright. It's still art, but this makes it much faster to go from concept to a successful experiment. So I think that's the role of mathematics. In the end, we would love to have a certifiable theorem saying for all of these possible terrains I described by splines and I put uh, rates of changes on the normals and things. We are not there. We're a long ways from there. So this is not certifiably a correct solution by any means. It's hacking with fancy mathematics and good insight built into it. I just admitted that on film, OK? <laughs> <laughs> and it's all your fault. It's all your fault, Jean Jacques. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank for that honest answer. <laughs> um, so in propositions two and three, you had the learning condition for phi and nu. Where, um, so it seems like that's predicated on how well you can do the classification that you showed. Do you have any sort of intuition or insight into how well does the classifier that you're training actually learn? Yeah, so imagine that the boundary condition you have is coming from a stabilizing feedback. And then you actually just took that feedback and moved it forward and got the vector fields from that. Then, then they would all be distinct, OK? So that would be a Hamilton, Jacoby, Bellman type thing. So if 
you had something that's like a feedback that you could do it, but we're trying to build this. So this is a, you know, an in, so what we're doing now is it's easy to linearize along one of these periodic trajectories. Okay, so fine, you solve the time varying hybrid uh, LQR problem. You get a cost function and we throw away the feedback. And then to des design the manifold, we fix the uh, weakly actuated states and then choose the um, strongly actuated components to minimize the cost to go from that point. And then we'll include the cons physical constraints on the nonlinear model when we're doing this. So we're using the LQR to give us something that's like a, a Lyapunov function, a control Lyapunov function. And if I had a true control Lyapunov function and I were doing that, my trajectories, I believe I could prove, would be distinct. So that's what we do. What Dennis did was something simpler. He said, I'm going to have a bunch of equilibria corresponding to walking in different directions at different speeds, and I will build these surfaces from one set of these to another and piece them together. And so that gave him kind of nominal stability. So at least it's not anti-stability fighting against you as most possible, and then it gives you the maximum probability of having crossings and stuff. So I think it's, uh, it's an area that's wide open for somebody to come in and do a much more refined mathematical analysis than what we've done. But I think we've got a really nice proof of concept and a conceptual framework that someone can come in who's maybe of Jean-Jacques uh, stature and clean this up. But um, I'm probably not able to do that anymore. When I was 35, yes, I think I would have done it, but I don't know if I can do it anymore. Um, okay, I'll take the uh, opportunity to answer. I wanted to push you a little bit more on the hybridness and yeah. bookkeeping. Um, so it seems that there are some systems where you might be able to sort of get away with avoiding to some degree the hybridness, but making sure that those transitions don't happen in weird situations. Mm -hmm. There are other systems where you might want to exploit the hybridness, right? Manipulation is clear, but in locomotion, I guess like things like um, um, like hard, hard stops, right? You have a knee where you can reach a limit. Right. And then that just right. generates another mode that you might want to be able to exploit. If you have more modes, yeah. what do we do? Yeah, that's a very, I hadn't thought about that. Mabel had these unilateral springs, Jonathan built into that robot. So that's like you have, so the spring had a hard stop in one direction, could flex in the other. So with that, when the leg hit the ground, you had springiness, but when you wanted to retract the leg, you didn't have to fight the spring, okay? So that's an excellent point. And I don't have an answer, okay? What we saw, the problem is, the reason we backed off our switching point from the hybrid transition is the um, impact map gives you a reduction in dimension on the other side. And so that meant we were only building initial conditions from a much smaller surface than we wanted to. Can you see that? Because when the middle, say we've got four dimensions, but you follow that through the impact, it removes one dimension because of the foot hitting the ground. The velocity goes to zero. And so now you've got three dimensions coming out the other side, and we felt that was causing robustness issues if we started too close to there. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's another open question. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? You just want to chat at the reception? All right. I guess uh, we can continue in the reception. <laughs>